Happy Sabbath to each one. Feliz sábado a todos. Están aquí. So we would, we would like to uh, just uh, start looking at some of our church ministry announcements. And first, we're going to hear from Pastor Jim about our upcoming evangelistic series and how each one can do their part through prayer. Pastor Jim. Thank you and good morning and happy Sabbath. It's good to be with you. I just saw Alex duck away into the foyer, and he needs to come out here. Okay, wonderful. Um, just this past Sabbath, I was traveling and was not here, um, but this card was distributed to the congregation. And this card is for the purpose of our Bible study focus in the month of March. It says, Just Ask. The point of this card is to encourage our church members to take one month to pray for specific individuals or perhaps specific streets where you will offer Bible studies. And so it gives you time to be praying for those individuals. And then at the end of the month, on March 30, I believe it is, the last Sabbath of the month, we will have Just Ask Sabbath. And at that time, we'll begin offering Bible studies to the people on our list over the next week. So, if you did not receive one of these cards last week, raise your hand because we'd like to distribute them to you. I know that many are not here every week. So if you did not get one last week, raise your hand. Raise it high so that the deacons can see you. Here we go. Very good. Raise your hand. Yes, I still see some of her on this side. Yes, our guests can receive one too if you'd like one. You can raise your hand. I see you want. Can I? Yeah, feel free. We have plenty if you'd like to see it. I'd just like to point out to you uh, what it says on the back of this card. It says, create a prayer list and write down the names of one or more people you plan to invite to a Bible study or to whom you will offer free Bible study guides. Notice, even if you're not ready to give a Bible study, but you're willing to offer our free Bible study guides, then you can still write those names down. Maybe you're going to invite them to a Bible study. Maybe you're going to ask somebody else to study with them. Or maybe you're just going to give them the study guides and let them fill them out on their own. None of that is important. What matters is that you put somebody down that you're going to offer some, in some form Bible study. You can consider friends, relatives, neighbors, co-workers, church visitors, or unbaptized youth, or you could write down the name of one or more streets. Maybe it's your own neighborhood. Maybe it's a street around the church here. Maybe it's one where we distributed literature and you'd like to go back now and offer Bible studies. Write down the name of the street. Maybe you need a week or two to find the right street. Go check it out and then write down that street. But write down something so that everyone can be offering Bible studies. The reason is because we will never get a Bible study that we don't ask for. And sometimes the reason we don't have them is we just don't ask. So the name of this initiative is Just Ask. That's all. It's not complicated. It's very simple. We encourage you to be praying and then to just ask. God bless each one of you. Thank you, Pastor Jim. And uh, we are looking forward to Easter. And we have a very special event coming up. And I invite um, Angela to come up and she's going to share with you about this special event. Um, hello, everybody. Yes, we are going to have an Easter program. It's called Blooming for Jesus. And it is um, for children. So bring the children, all the children. Um, we're going to be walking through the last week of um, Jesus' life and his resurrection on March 31st. That's the Sunday, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And following, if weather permitting, we'll have a church picnic. So you'll hear more details from me. But just keep in mind that there's blooming for Jesus. And all children are invited and their parents and all the adults as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, and please make plans uh, to uh, join uh, that and uh, coming up this end of March. So thank you, Angela, and for the teams who are helping to do their part to help us to proclaim the three angels' messages and to help make disciples in our community. At this time, I'm going to invite my uh, dynamic duo of Pastor Jim Howard and Pastor Joe Reeves to come forward because we, this special Sabbath, we have a great delegation, and I want them to introduce the team here who are visiting with us. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Yes, it is a special Sabbath. Um, those of you uh, who know Pastor Joe and I know that we work at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. We work together in the same department, the Department of Sabbath School and Personal Ministries. And Pastor Joe is the inverse editor, and uh, the inverse, of course, is the young adult Bible study guide uh, for Sabbath School, and he's also an assistant director in the department. Well, he has been leading... Uh, a special delegation here for a training time, an advisory uh, from the Inter-American Division. So we have with us the Sabbath School Director from the Inter-American Division, as well as the Sabbath School Directors from nearly every union and many conferences in the Inter-American Division. You may have noticed some friends that you didn't know sitting around you, and that's why we're so glad that they're here, and we would like to welcome the Sabbath School Director of the Division, Dr. Samuel Telemach. Uh, thank you, Dr. Telemach, for being here. We're so grateful. Uh, perhaps you could come up and greet the group. I got to be in his Sabbath School class today. Amen. What a powerful Sabbath School it was. And uh, we're just grateful that he is here. He's going to just share a brief greeting, and then Pastor Joe will have some uh, announcements. Thank you very much, Dr. Howard and Dr. Reeves. At the Inter-American Division, it's a very large division, and we discover a unique problem in our division, that our members or youth between the ages of 15 to 35, we have the highest attrition rate among that particular age group. And Dr. Ellie Henry and uh, his administrators, we decided that we would do something about it to solve that and address this problem. We thought about it, how best to do it, and then the idea came to our leaders that we would invite all our Sabbath school directors of Inter-American Division to the General Conference headquarters to, so that they can receive advanced training on how to teach religious education to our young people within the ages of 15 to 35 so we can correct and the, 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 the steady increase of at, with attrition among that age, particular age group. So we came, and I can tell you, we have been blessed with Dr. the training from Dr. Reeves and Dr. Uh, Howard, tremendous training. All of our Sabbath school directors are leaving Washington with a new vision, a new understanding. They, they received three new things, new knowledge, new skills, and new attitudes. I can tell you, the training we have received, Dr. Howard and Dr. Reeves, have changed into America forever. Because we believe the, 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 the young people who will receive the training from, our, from us, and inverse, inverse will become the number one Bible study guide in inter-American division. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you each one for being here. And to introduce them, who they are. No. Oh. Yes, yes. Yes. All, all of the all Those of the directors, the... please, from Inter-American Division. They're coming from all over there's, the Inter-American. Many that are downstairs because there's translation for Spanish downstairs. Okay. So this is about half or two thirds. Yes. We have about 45 of us. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you so much. Uh, last uh, July, when I was flying back from Trinidad, I was in the airplane with uh, Doctor Telemach. And I found out it's a little bit dangerous to fly with him because you get a lot of good ideas at 33,000 feet high. And he said, you know, I think we need to do an inverse advisory. And I said, what is an inverse advisory? And uh, as we continued dialoguing, uh, we came up with a great plan. And I told him the Tridelphia Church is not the largest church, but they wanted to worship with us and we wanted to uh, receive them. So uh, there is Spanish translation downstairs, and uh, so we appreciate the translators that have been helping us, and if you uh, would prefer listening to the message today in Spanish, you can join down there. 
Uh, because of the logistics of our crowd today and lunch, uh, the fellowship meal will be 15, 20 minutes later than usual. It's going to take some time for the deacons to set up downstairs. So when church is dismissed, please uh, relax and be patient and visit. It'll be a little bit longer before lunch is ready. And then we will enjoy a great fellowship uh, meal together. All are welcome. There's plenty of food that we have here today. And we welcome each to the Tridelphia Church today. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Joe and Dr. Telemuk and the delegation from uh, IAD. We welcome you on this uh, high Sabbath. Uh, we also uh, have our last announcement from uh, Pastor, I mean, uh, from Elder uh, Albert Kazako. If you could come forward. Yes, it's, every, every day is happy Sabbath and everyone is a pastor. So, But that is actually biblical in the fact that we have the priesthood of all believers. So. Please minister to us. Albert is our head deacon. Well, I didn't know I'm a pastor. <laughs> Thanks very much, <laughs> Pastor, Pastor Doug. We are all excited about our building project, and this is going to start soon. You know. So the message I've brought to you is about storage. Do we, we know already the, uh, the parts which are going to be affected? It's the roof, the personage and the room beyond the men's bathroom. So if you have anything in these places, please I will ask you to go and take some inventory and see which ones you, we really need to use. Otherwise we are running short of places to store our, our equipment and our items. So if you have something that you cannot carry or something, just write it when we have our uh, work be, we will help you to get those things and just let us know where we can take them. And uh, these departments like uh, the AV team, I think those are the only ones who have something to do with our roof here. The, um, uh, the men's ministries and also uh, personal ministries, ACS and dinner with the doctor. Just to mention a few, I'm going to ask you just take an inventory, look at what you need so that we can just narrow our uh, items that we can keep uh, in the church. Thank you. Thank you, and we appreciate and believe in the priesthood of all believers here where everyone has something to do because we believe in total member involvement. So from the kids who are helping with the PA, I want to say thank you to those uh, who are in, even in training. So thank you to each one for uh, doing their part. This time we'd like to have our call to worship, and we invite you to open your Bibles to Psalms 25, and there we will read together uh, verses 1 through 5. Psalms 25, verses 1 through 5 is our scripture for our call to worship. And if you have your Bible open to Psalms 25 or your app open, please say amen. Amen. All right, some of you I still see are scrolling in your devices and uh, as well as turning your pages. So let's, uh, let's read. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul... Oh my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let my enemies triumph. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Amen. Amen. We invite you to kneel, if uh, all possible, to, as we have our, uh, our prayer at this time. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, on this beautiful Sabbath day, we know by faith that here the weather is raining, but above the clouds, your glorious, uh, it can be seen in the heavens. 
And so here, as we come together as part of your body of Christ, uh, with each one here, we want to praise you and uplift our hearts in gratitude to you. Thank you for each one and for the opportunity that we have through religious liberty and freedom to come and worship as you've instructed us in your word. We ask now that you will uh, continue to prepare our hearts to receive the message that you have uh, prepared and placed in Pastor Jim Howard's uh, heart and bless him and anoint him as he preaches today. And help each one of us as we continue to do our part to help make disciples in preparation for your soon return. As it says here in, the, in your word, Lord, that we will look forward to that day when you will come. That And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So may that day come quickly, Lord, and may we each do our part to hasten your return. We intercede now for our church family here locally, that we think of those who are not feeling well. We also want to intercede for those who are serving overseas. Uh, we think of Anne and Mark Schwizo, who are serving in Adra, Cambodia, and continue to bless them in their work as they serve to uh, help do their part in that nation. So guide us now, this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Our opening hymn is number 21, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Let's stand up. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we invite you to be with us, and we ask that you bless us now. And as we continue our service, 
guide us and fill us. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, dear brothers and sisters. All right, so um, it's the moment of the offerings, but uh, since we have so many distinguished visitors today, and I've heard a lot of people in uh, Central America say that in heaven we will speak Spanish, uh, <laughs> even though I've also heard many people be absolutely sure that it's going to be English, so uh, we don't know. But Pastor Reeves told me to give a small welcome in Spanish. So I'm switching the cassette. Uh, <laughs> a todos los hermanos que nos visitan de Interamérica, bienvenidos a nuestra iglesia. Amen. Estamos muy contentos de recibirlos. Por favor, siéntanse en casa. Y estamos muy contentos de las bendiciones que están recibiendo por el trabajo del pastor eh, Howard y el pastor Reeves. Amen. Y aplicando también Inverse en sus respectivos campos. La iglesia definitivamente necesita buenos maestros. Así que bienvenidos a nuestra iglesia. Amen. All right, so switching back the other cassette. Uh, <laughs> um, so today the offering goes to uh, Adventist World Radio. And we are grateful for the role that the radio has around the world and reaches all places in the globe. And it's a blessing and, and we frequently hear many uh, incredible stories of how the message is being spread, our beautiful message is being spread out around the world. Uh, let me read a Bible verse uh, that says, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Amen. For now, please ask uh, our deacons to please stand, and I uh, will pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your mercy. We just give you a very small uh, portion of what you give us every day, and I pray, Lord, that you use this means for reaching uh, those who are looking for your message, who are asking the que questions of your second coming, and bless also the churches around the world, and, and this church also with all the plans that we have. In your name, amen. amen. I will ask now the children to come forward to grab the baskets and the funds are used for 
Christian education. All right, let's sing number 218, When He Cometh. Sit on the, you can sit on the ground if you like. There's room for everybody. Oh, there's some space right here. You want to sit on there? You can sit right there. So I right now sit right here. Okay. <clears throat> everybody have a seat. Good morning, boys and girls. Do I have a story for you this morning? Yes. Now, we're going to learn some new words this morning. And one of them is, does anybody know what a creepy crawler is? What's a creepy crawler? A bug. Now, you know, some people don't mind bugs. and I know somebody, if they see an ant, they go crazy. Just one ant. Ah! So I'm going to use somebody to demonstrate creepy crawler means. So watch this. Creepy crawler is a thing with legs. See? Watch this. He doesn't do anything. But what if I say spiders? Oh, it would feel weird. So some people like creepy crawlers, and there's spiders, and there's ants, and there's millipedes and centipedes. Well, remember that creepy crawlers. So when little Wayne was a little bit bigger than you all, he was maybe about this big, his daddy did like construction work and he worked on houses. And they went to this one house. Now who's, who has a basement at their house? Do you have a downstairs? Who doesn't have a basement? Some houses don't have a basement. Some houses are built right on top of the ground. But did you know most of those houses that are on top of the ground, there's a little space between the house and the ground. They call it a crawl space. You ever heard of that? And that's where the pipes run. You probably don't know it, but somewhere in that house, there's probably a door. If you open up that door, you can look down and see under your house. Oh. Yes. So daddy is working, and, the, and they're working, and they said, well, oh, we have a problem at this house. We're going to have to do some work with the pipes because of the water. We need to shut off all the water to the house. So there's this thing called a valve, and that's how you shut the water off. Guess where the valve was? Under the house. And the only way to get to it is in the crawl space. So there's this door, you all. And there's a door. And, and Daddy goes over to the door. And he opens the door. And he looks down in there. And it's dark. And he goes, uh-oh. There's only about that much space. I can't fit in here. And the other guys can't fit in here. We need somebody to small to go down into the crawl space. 
And who did they look at? Little Wayne, because Little Wayne was the smallest one. But Little Wayne was like, I don't know. I've seen crawl spaces before. Crawl spaces are weird spots. They have like nasty things down there because it's under the house and it's dark and you can't really see very well. And that's kind of what a crawl space looks like. But, but it wasn't a nice crawl space like that. It was a, guess what lives in the crawl space? Creepy, craw you're right. So Little Wayne said he looked down in the hole and he saw a few spider webs. He's like, oh, I don't want to go in there. So little Wayne got his flashlight, and he said, I'm going to look a little further to see what's in there. So little Wayne shone his flashlight in there, and what did he see then? Oh, my goodness, it was a whole lot more. And he's like, Daddy, I don't think I want to go down in the crawl space. And guess what Daddy said? Daddy said, little Wayne, I'll pay you. Little Wayne said, really? <laughs> How much? Daddy said, little Wayne, if you go down in that crawl space, I'll give you $100. Oh, Little Wayne was like, $100? Now, back then, $100 could buy. And, oh, so Little Wayne, see, oh, Little Wayne said, $100? I think I'll do it, but I have to get ready. So Little Wayne, you know Little Wayne. Little Wayne is prepared. He got his suit out, and he put the suit on. He's got to go down in there with the creepy crawlers, and you don't want any creeper crawlers on you, so you got to put the suit on. But little Wayne was like, you know what? I don't think this is going to be enough. I think they could still get to me. So little Wayne started putting on more. He says, I think I'll put on this on top just to make sure creepy crawlers, because creepy crawlers are small, and they might get around. So little Wayne took some time. I tell you, little Wayne got ready. He was putting on layers and layers of stuff to make sure that the creepy crawlers couldn't get to him. So this mic doesn't make all the noise. So Little Wayne put this on. And then what else did Little Wayne need, you all? What else do you think he needed? Well, he had another pair of pants. And of course, he had to put on the hat. And he had to put on so they could, creepy crawlers could get in your ears. <laughs> and then, ugh. You had to cover up everything that you had to cover up. You had to get the glove. So you had to put the gloves on. Hey, I have a bright flashlight. What I'm going to do, I'm going to shine the light. You go down in the hole, and I'm going to shine the light. Because little Wayne didn't have room to hold a flashlight. He had one of these little headlights, but it wouldn't stay on. So little Wayne said, OK, Daddy, $100. If Daddy says he's going to give me $100, Daddy always keeps his promises. If he said $100, he's going to give me $100. And if Daddy says he's going to be back there, I know he's going to be back there. So little Wayne got up, and he went in the door, and he turned on his flashlight, and Daddy put the flashlight behind him. He got down in there, and he went in the crawl space, and he disappeared. He was gone. And little Wayne had to crawl on his hands and knees, and he crawled all the way over. He got to the valve, and he... Shut it off! And he felt things. Oh, it's not just me. He's crawling a little way. He crawled back. He crawled back to the door. And he could barely go to the door. And he got up. And, he, ah, ah, and he's covered in spider webs. And he saw mice and frogs. Do you know what else likes to live in crawl spaces? What likes to eat bugs? Snakes! Oh, man. There's snakes and all kinds of. And he's covered in cobwebs. And he gets out. And then he says, ah, How was he? Oh, I says, Where's my $100? <laughs> sure enough, Daddy gave him five 100 He gave him five $20 bills. Little Wayne took all that off, and he says, Phew, guess what? I don't have to go back in there again. Whew. Boys and girls, sometimes we're going to have difficulty. We're going to have to go into unpleasant places. But what is the moral of the story? If our daddy tells us there's going to be a reward, there's going to be a reward. And our daddy does not lie. Whatever he promises us is waiting for us. When it's over, he's going to do it. And you know the second thing? He's always with us if you just look at the light. Little Wayne was down in the darkness, and he could, but he could still see the light coming around him. Daddy, are you there? I'm still here, little Wayne. I got the light. Who is our daddy? Don't we have a daddy named Jesus? And what does he do? He makes promises that even when we have to get in nasty things with the creepy, crawly people, he's always there with us if we 
stay watching the light. What is our, our, our next slide, please? And there, there are two texts, and I want you all to ask your mommy and daddy to show you when you get home. The, in the Bible, it talks about God is the light, and he's always with us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, because we know it's true today. We've got to go down to some dark places and some creepy, crawly places, and the earth seems crazy sometimes. So, Lord, help these children and help the adults to focus, to remember your promises will not fail. And as long as we see the light, Lord, we're in the right place because we know you are there with us. Forgive us and save us in Jesus' name. Amen. Tridelphia little ringers.
It's not easy to be a little ringer, you know. So thank you for being so brave to come up here and share your talents with us. I would like to share the Sabbath thought with you this morning. It's from uh, Manuscript Releases. You'll see it in your bulletin. You can join me and follow along. Our Sabbath thought this morning, every soul is to obtain an education with the object in view of imparting his knowledge to others. The powers of the mind are God's gift, and we are to use them to benefit and bless the members of the human family. As the mind is enlarged by true knowledge, the heart will be softened and subdued into humility, kindness, and true love. We are to gather all the knowledge possible for the purpose of communicating the same, uh, communicating the same that it may become the property of others. Amen. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 13, 51 to 52 for our scripture reading this morning. Matthew 13, verses 51 and 52. Matthew 13, 51 and 52. The Bible says, Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Happy Sabbath. Well, have you been blessed already this morning? I know I have. I apologize to our sound booth, but I ran off without getting the lapel mic. Could I have somebody bring me a lapel mic? I can get started without it. Well, I don't know if you've looked at your bulletin yet this morning to see the title of the sermon today. Have you looked? It's called Learning to Do What? Learning to Teach. Learning to Teach. Now, we, uh, <laughs> the hotspot popped up on my iPad. We know that pastors and elders and teachers are all called to teach, but what about the rest of the church? What about the rest of the church? Let me ask you a question. How many of you self-consider yourselves teachers? And... <laughs> How many of you consider yourselves learners? Oh, we have a much bigger group. I hope you know that in order to be a learner, you have to be a teacher. And uh, that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. And I pray that God will speak to each of our hearts and help us to see what his intent for us is from his word. So as we begin, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads one more time, and I'm going to ask the Lord's blessing. I would normally kneel in the front here, but I, oh, I do have a mic. I'll use this. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege of being able to study your word and to, to find out your will from your holy word. We pray that as we spend this time, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would help give us understanding, and that you would empower us to do your will. Now, Lord, abide with us through our time of study, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I'd like to begin by turning to a familiar passage. Okay, thank you. Let's turn together to Matthew chapter 28 while I get my mic on. Matthew chapter 28.
Matthew chapter 28, and I think we're on. Good. Thank you, brothers. Appreciate that. Now, of course, you're familiar with Matthew chapter 28, because this is what we refer to as the Great Commission. I'd like to look at it together with you, beginning in verse 18. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. Have you found it? All right, well, two of you have, and that's plenty. So let's get started. In Matthew 28, verse 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and do what? Now it depends on your translation, doesn't it? If you have a newer translation, it says, Go therefore and make disciples. If you have a King James Version, it says, Go therefore and do what? Teach all nations. Teach all nations. Then it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, here in the Great Commission that has been entrusted to us by our Savior, it starts by saying, go and make disciples, which is also translated, go and teach all nations. Now, why is that? The the verb here is mathetuo, which comes from a disciple, mathetes in the Greek, which comes from the word manthano, which means to learn. So the idea of teach comes from the fact that this is talking about a learner. So go and make learners. Okay, so the idea of teaching is inherent in the Great Commission. Not only here, but after baptism, it then says we are to teach again. Isn't that right? It says then we're to teach them to observe all things what? Jesus says that I have commanded you. Or we might want to say that I have taught you. So what Jesus has instructed us, we are commanded in the Great Commission to instruct others. Teaching is at the heart of the Great Commission. We learn first, and then we teach. This is nothing special It's nothing out of the ordinary. It's actually very natural. This is how life works. We learn, and then we teach. And by teaching, we learn more. It's all part of the cycle of life. That's really all it is. One of my favorite descriptions of this is found in the book, The Desire of Ages. The Desire of Ages is a book written by Ellen White, one of the founders of our church, who we believe had special inspiration from God. And she wrote a powerful passage on page 20 of the book, The Desire of Ages on the Life of Christ. It says this, There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal, in turn, minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and then unfold their beauty and blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean itself, the source of all our springs and fountains, receives from the streams from every land, but takes in order to give. The mists ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth that it may bring forth and bud. Isn't that beautiful? It's very poetic. It describes how all of nature takes in order to give, except for one thing. Did you catch it? Except for the selfish heart of man. It's the only thing in God's creation that takes and then doesn't always, in correspondence, give. But God wants to restore us. Which means that when we learn knowledge, we learn it to share it. That is the principle that God wants the universe to have. We take in order to give. The book Desire of Ages also says this, The Savior's commission to the disciples included all the believers. 
So this was not just a commission given to pastors or elders or teachers, but rather to all believers. Then she says this, Whatever one's calling in life, his first interest should be to win souls to Christ. He may not be able to speak to congregations, but he can work for individuals. To them, he can communicate the instruction received from his Lord. So every Christian, every disciple of Christ, though they may not be particularly gifted to speak to congregations, can still minister to individuals. And with the instruction that they have received from the Lord, they can individually share with others that same instruction. So we just need to understand this. We're not all pastors or elders. We don't have the same authority or even the same giftedness. But every disciple of Christ has a teaching ministry at some level. And today I want you to embrace your inner teacher. I want you to embrace your inner teacher. Think of yourself this morning as a teacher. Now, there's different ways that we teach. Some of you are musicians, isn't that right? I'm reminded of Colossians 3.16 that says that we should let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Isn't that beautiful? One way that we teach is through music. And there are many who are especially gifted at this. The Bible also tells us in Titus chapter 2 that the older women of the church should instruct the younger women of the church and teach what is good. So we know that our women have a teaching ministry in many different respects, but certainly in teaching the younger women. It could, of course, equally be said that of the men and the younger men. Interestingly, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and chapter 3, we learn about the teaching ministry of Timothy, a minister. And I'd like you to turn there with me so you can see it for yourself. This is in the T books right before Hebrews in the New Testament. Five books that begin with the letter T, and this one is uh, 2 Timothy that we're going to turn to, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And Timothy is instructing, I'm sorry, Paul is instructing Timothy in this letter. And let's look there together in verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14 of 2 Timothy. The Apostle Paul writes, But you, speaking to Timothy, must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Now you would think that the Apostle Paul was here speaking of himself, because he was the spiritual father, as it were, of young minister Timothy. But notice verse 15. And that from when? Childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Where did Timothy learn the Holy Scriptures from childhood? We learn about that in chapter 1, don't we? Where in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, the apostle writes to Timothy of his mother and his grandmother. And I'm looking for the specific verse because I didn't write it down, so tell me when you find it. Maybe it's because I've... Verse 5, thank you. Verse 5, he says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Mothers and fathers have a very clearly prescribed teaching ministry according to the Bible. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says that we should teach our children diligently when we stand up, when we sit down, when we walk by the way, in all uh, phases of life and in all circumstances of life, parents are to instruct or teach their children. So we have these ministries that are beautiful, that God has given to us. And then, of course, there's one teaching ministry that all of us should have. I'll read from the 
book Testimonies from the, for the Church, volume 9, page 30. There are many ways in which church members may give the message to those around them. One of the most successful is by living helpful, unselfish Christian lives. One of the best ways that we teach is by simply following the instruction that God has given us. And then our example is a lesson book for those around us. We teach, we instruct by the lives we live. We teach by the music that we play and that we sing. We teach as older ones to younger ones and oftentimes the other way around as well. Now, I'd like to share something important, however, a principle, lest we put ourselves in a box. I have pastored local churches for many years, and one thing that was always a struggle was when we had very capable young parents who were very diligent to teach their children but felt that during their time of parenting, that excluded them from any other type of teaching ministry because they needed to focus on their children. I'd like you to hear what Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2 says to a particular parent who was of this mindset. Page 77, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 77. Your interest and efforts and anxieties are for your family and your relatives. But you have not entertained the idea of reaching out for others around you, overcoming your reluctance to exert an influence outside of a special circle. All should have an interest for their relatives, but should not allow themselves to be shut up to them as though they were the only ones whom Jesus came to save. I skipped past some of the stronger language in this. You can look it up for yourself. For our, you know, the palat palatability of the passage. But she spoke very strongly that we should not put ourselves in a box and say that we only can, can shed a teaching influence in this one particular way. Whether it's to our children and families or whether it's in music or whether it's in our lives, we need to recognize that God has given us opportunities and we should not try to tell ourselves that we are unable to share our faith in other ways than what seems to come naturally to us. This is one of the things I learned from reading the book of Acts. You know, the disciples were not naturally uh, trained for preaching and teaching. Many of them were fishermen. And yet, in the book of Acts, you find them actively sharing their faith and teaching others who then also shared their faith. And then they, in their prayers, they prayed for boldness. Now, who has to pray for boldness? People who don't have it. People who are afraid. People who are hesitant. And so the very nature of of faith is that we need to be able to come out of our comfort zone. And that may be, at a, you may be at a different step than others, but everybody needs to stretch themselves as part of how we grow. Now I'd like to go to the passage that we had for our scripture reading today. It's in Matthew chapter 13. Take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 51. Matthew 13, beginning with verse 51. Now, this is at the end of, of a, a long chapter which had several parables. And so Jesus was actively teaching the people with parables, one parable after another. And at the end of the chapter, Jesus asks a question. And this is coming to the end of the chapter. We're going to look at verse 51. Jesus said to them, Have you what? understood all these things. This is an important principle of teaching, isn't it? Asking if they understand what you've shared. And he wants to know, did you understand what I've taught? And they said to him, yes, Lord. Now, the moment that they said to Jesus, yes, we understood your teaching, they now, that means that they are capable of doing what? 
of teaching or sharing with someone else what they have learned because they understand it. And so Jesus makes this very point beginning in verse 52. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now, a couple of comments. I'm going to take a couple of comments out of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. First, on the scribe, the language of a scribe. Here, Christ does not refer to the professional scribes or teachers of his day, but to the disciples in their role of teachers or apostles. And every scribe here means every man or woman who takes part in opening the treasures of God's word to others. And then the commentary continues, literally, and he's speaking now of the passage that says, instructed concerning the, the kingdom. The person who's instructed literally means which has been made a disciple. Now the verb there is, happens to be the same one that is in the Great Commission, Mathetuo, the one that, that we use to say, uh, go and make disciples. But here it's who has become a disciple. It's in a slightly different tense, but it's the same word. And it says, literally, which has been made a disciple, in the sense of having received a thorough training in the things a disciple should know and understand. So here it's describing someone who basically is learning from a master or a teacher, and now they have understood. They've been instructed. And after being instructed, the Bible says they are like a householder who brings out of his treasure things what? New and old. New and old. This is talking about the person who has been instructed and understands now brings out of his treasure, so now he is instructing others with things new and old. There's valuable lessons in this. One of them is that teaching requires understanding that we've gained in the past, but it also requires fresh insights. It requires fresh learning. In other words, the teacher is always a learner. And by learning, he's getting new insights which he can use in his or her teaching. This is the principle that Jesus is sharing. Now, Ellen White writes about this. There's a, actually a chapter in the book Christ's Object Lessons about this short little parable. She says, The treasure gained by the householder he does not hoard. You understand hoard. Like keep it to himself. Store it up. He brings it forth to communicate to others. And check this out. And by use, the treasure increases. The householder has precious things, both new and old. So Christ teaches that the truth committed to his disciples is to be communicated to the world. And as the knowledge of truth is imparted, it will increase. So, a learner has a cap beyond which a learner cannot learn unless they teach. And as they teach, they expand their capacity to learn. This is why anyone who calls themselves a learner, if they're honest, must become a teacher. Now, I don't mean that you have to stand up like I am right now and teach. But as was described earlier, we need to be willing to share the things we understand to help others to understand them also. And this increases our capacity to know and to learn. She also says in that chapter, all who receive the gospel message into the heart will long to proclaim it. You see, it's not something that someone needs to command you to do. It's something that is somewhat natural. Somewhat natural. When was the last time you said, oh, I want to show you something to a member of your family? Oh, I, oh, 
I, I saw something. I want to show you something. Or maybe, oh, guess what I heard today? Do you ever do that in day-to-day life? You're a teacher. It's natural. When you hear something that impacts you, you just tell people. It's not something that somebody has to force you to do. It's something that you recognize you want to do. It's natural to share the news, to share new information that you have learned. But only if you think it will be interesting or helpful to someone. Right? It's really only if you think it would be interesting to them or helpful to them. You don't share everything you learn. You only share what impacts you. You only share what persuades you. And as you share it, you remember it. If I think about all the things that I learned in school and how little of it I still know, it dawns on me that it's because I never used it. Have you ever thought about that? I never shared it with anyone. Between high school and college, I took seven French classes. Seven French classes. And I can barely remember how to say hello now. Bonjour, mes amis. For those of you who are judging me now because I've forgotten all my French. I used to say little things in French around the house. And my children, they knew that I would say a little, you know, oh, suivez-moi, you know, follow me. Or little, little things that I remember. And I would say little things in French around the house. But my, my daughter pointed out to me recently that I've stopped doing that. And that now I'm saying little things in Spanish around the house. Oh, I'm paquito, I'm paquito. Why do you think that is? It's because of Janet Partica. That's what it is. It's because I have a secretary who speaks Spanish. Now we've hired another one who also speaks Spanish. And I had a director not long ago who spoke Spanish. And all around me was Spanish. (laughs) There's an important principle here. Not only can you not learn more if you don't teach, you know what I'm about to say, but you lose what you learned if you don't teach. You lose it. And if the truth be known, this is why many church members are afraid to share their faith now, is because they've actually forgotten it. And they have little bits and pieces that they know. Little bits and pieces that they remember but they're nervous, they're too nervous because they feel that that's not enough. I can understand that. I need to tell you about the first Bible study that I gave. I was newly converted. I was converted at the age of 22. And uh, my dad, who had left the Adventist church, we asked him to take us to church somewhere. And since he still believed that if you were going to go to church, you ought to go on the Sabbath, he took us to the nearest Adventist church. And there I began to interact with church members, and I, I met someone who was a young man who had a friend from Andrews University area who came into town, and he would do weeks of prayer and things like that. And he came over to my mother's house where I was uh, at that time living, and he would give us a Bible study in the afternoon. And he brought with him a whiteboard. And he brought with him a couple of books by Ellen White and his Bible. He brought Desire of Ages, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, and his Bible. And a whiteboard and whiteboard markers. And he began to show us things about the character of God through this illustration that he did. And then he would turn, we'd turn to verses and passages in these books and read them. And I was so incredibly moved and impacted by these powerful Bible studies on the character of God. But it was, kind of, he, 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 it was kind of almost an illustration, and he compared Cain and Abel and, and their characteristics, and he, he did it, it was just done so beautifully. I was just deeply impacted by it. So what do you think I did? I invited other people who were in the church to come over next Sabbath. Because, and I asked this guy to do it again. And oh man, and they were like, wow, that was incredible. And I was like, yeah, I told you, I told you, oh, that was incredible. And then, what do you think I did later that week? 
We had people come over that evening. I had other people come over. And I, again, oh, man, it's incredible. Oh, yeah. it, and it was. It was incredible. Then they left. And we had some friends who had been gone, and they came back in town. And we're like, oh, I cannot believe you missed it. I can't believe you missed it. And an idea popped into my head. I know this backwards and forwards now. All I need, what do I need? I need a whiteboard, some dry erase markers, my Bible, Desire of Ages, and Patriarchs and Prophets. And so I said, I mean, I don't know, but I'll, let me try to show you what they did. And so I went through it. I just had this feeling that if I could somehow do what they did, that these friends of ours would be impacted the way that I was impacted. And so I started going through the whole thing. And I turned to the passages and had them read the paragraphs, just like, just like they did. I mean, if ever there was a copycat Bible study, it was it, man. I copied exactly what they did. And you know what? They loved it. They loved it. They were just as impacted as I was. Well, maybe not as much, but they were impacted. And I realized uh, a real lesson. Now, over time, I continued to use that study, but I began to learn some things, and I began to adapt it a little bit. Insert little things, remove little things, and adapt it. And make it to, at least to my liking, even better. This is how people are taught. This is how people learn. First, I was impacted. I was taught. I was persuaded. Then what came next? I observed. Repetition. I observed. And I continued to see them do it. Three or four times. They did it. And I watched and listened and learned and saw how they did it. Then what? I participated. I did it myself. I copied them. I imitated them. And I began to do it myself. Almost exactly like they did it. And then what did I begin to do? To adapt it. Because I now owned it. I understood it better. And I was adapting it. And this is how we learn. We learn first. Then we observe. Then we share all these things. So when we're doing training or teaching, whether it's our young people or, or any type of training that we have, first, we have instruction. It's important. But it's not the most important. Second, we have observation. People learn by watching what we're doing. And then third, there is participation. That's the hands-on learning. And once someone has done that, they can begin to adapt and use it on their own. A few statements on this point, just to bring it home. Ellen White writes in the book Evangelism about the disciples. In their association with the Master, the disciples obtained a practical training for missionary work. They saw how he presented truth and how he dealt with the perplexing questions that arose in his ministry. They saw his ministry in healing the sick wherever he went. They heard him preach the gospel to the poor. What are these highlighting? Observation. Instruction was obvious. Jesus was always instructing. But do you see here that it wasn't just instruction. It was observation that gave them this power. In fact... In the Desire of Ages, page 349, it says, In the training of the disciples, the example of the Savior's life was far more effective than any mere doctrinal instruction. So the example that they observed was actually the, the even more important training than the instruction itself that he gave. And then in the Acts of the Apostles, page 32, it describes what happened when Jesus then sent out the twelve and the seventy. She writes, when he sent forth the twelve and afterward the seventy to proclaim the kingdom of God, he was teaching them their duty to impart to others what he had made known to them. Not just teaching them how to do it, but teaching them their duty to do it. He was impressing upon them that, this, that after you learn, you need to share. He was impressing that upon them. Jesus was. And then she says this, in all his work, he was training them 
for individual labor. Not necessarily that they were going to preach to the masses, but every believer, as they watched Jesus and as they were sent out, He was training them for how they could individually speak to others. Individually share what they have understood from His instruction with others. How are we as a church going to fulfill the Great Commission to teach all things whatsoever I have instructed you to observe unless our people are all in an individual basis sharing, teaching to children, to families, to others in our sphere of influence. Now as the disciples and as we speak of the Savior, what happens to us? Also in the book Christ's Object Lessons, it says this, He who begins with a little knowledge, a poquito, in a humble way, and tells what he knows while seeking diligently for further knowledge, will find the whole heavenly treasure awaiting his demand. The more he seeks to impart light, the more light he will receive. The more one tries to explain the Word of God to others with a love for souls, the plainer it becomes to himself. This is the nature of our growth spiritually, is that we need to have expression of our faith in order to grow our faith. We need to have expression of our knowledge in order to grow our knowledge. There have been many times where I've been preaching a sermon and I taught and I, and I learned something where I've been giving a Bible study and I learned something. While I was speaking, I realized something. And the Lord, through His Spirit, just opened up my view and shined light, a brighter light on the topic. This only happens when we give expression to our faith. And as I mentioned, this is precisely why so many church members never share the truth that they've learned. Do you know the Apostle Paul talks about those who are always learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth? Always learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. This can happen if we don't uh, tie it down in our brains by expressing it. Because many of us only have a little knowledge, un poquito, un peu, there's my French. Because we only have a little knowledge, we feel vulnerable. We think that we need a lot of knowledge before we can begin to share it. But we don't realize that we can't gain a lot of knowledge without sharing it. We can't get there. We can't become a proficient teacher unless we begin to express what we do understand. This is an important principle. And if we don't share it, we will have less knowledge. And our knowledge will decrease. I want to show you this in the Bible. Look at Hebrews chapter 5 with me. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews is in the New Testament all the way back to Revelation. Then you pass the 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John. And you're going to come to Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 2. 12. And I'm going to read something that is almost alarming when you first read it. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. Have you found it? We believe this was written by the Apostle Paul, who had a lot to write about teaching. Notice verse 12. For though by this time you what? What's it say? Ought to be what? Teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use 
have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Do you see the principle here? The apostle is saying, by now you ought to be teachers. Let me just say, a learner is not supposed to be a lifelong uh, capped learner. They are supposed to come to a point where they begin to shift from just being a consumer to being a producer and a consumer. A, a channel. And so he's saying, by now, you're to the point, you've learned enough where you ought to be teachers. But because you're not teaching, you're losing even what you know, and now I have to give you just like I'm teaching you from scratch again. Do you see that? And why? Because they have not, by reason of use, by reason of use, had their senses exercised to have that discernment of truth. This is very important. We need to give expression to our faith. If we do not, we lose the amount that we do know. And we begin to have only bits and pieces that we remember. In the book Christian Service, page 58, 58, Ellen White says, It is evident that all the sermons that have been preached have not developed a large class of self-denying workers. In other words, all the learning, all the sermons, all the learning that we're getting are not producing self-denying workers. This subject is to be considered as involving the most serious results. Our future for eternity is at stake. The churches are withering up because they have failed to use their talents in diffusing light. What's it mean to diffuse light? I mean, light comes from heaven, and then we become a channel to diffuse light to others, right? And because we're not doing that, she says, the churches are withering up. What's another word for withering up? Dying. Dying. This is what happens to us individually. If we have no means of diffusing light, we wither up. And we don't have this large class of disciples, self-denying workers, because all we're getting is learning. Preaching, preaching, preaching. And we're not having that learning process uh, made solid by diffusing that light to others. You know, you don't need to know a lot to be a teacher. You don't need to know a lot. You only need to know a little. Isn't that what we read? The little knowledge. Start with that little knowledge. I think of the woman at the well who learned just a little bit and went and ran to her townsfolk Told them, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. She used the knowledge that she had. She was persuaded by Jesus. And that persuasion was enough to cause her to diffuse light to others. I think about the man whose blindness, uh, who, who was blind and his blindness was taken away. He was healed. And it was on the Sabbath and the Pharisees got upset. I don't know if you remember this story. They came to talk to his parents. Find out, is this guy really blind? What's going on? He's like, yeah, this is our son. He was blind from birth. Then they go to him. Hey, who is this man? Is this man a sinner who did this to you? And what did he say? Like, I don't know all that. All I can tell you is, I was blind, and now he put a thing on my eye, now I can see. Did he need a lot of knowledge to diffuse light? No, and here's the key. We don't have to think that we need to be able to give every answer. That's not what God has asked to do, us to do. In the Bible, a witness is someone who shares what he has seen and heard. That's what he personally knows, what he personally experiences. All you need to be able to share is what you personally know. If all you know is that, that interaction you had with Jesus, then go and tell your townsfolk about it, just like the woman at the well, and you don't need to know everything else just yet. That will come in time, and God will expand your knowledge. Furthermore, it's important that we recognize that even in our Sabbath schools and in our schools, our educational system, 
that there's a principle of learning that can be applied. Councils on Sabbath School Work, page 165 says, It is a wise educator who seeks to call out the ability and powers of the student instead of constantly endeavoring to impart instruction. Did you catch that? The way to teach people sometimes is to ask them to teach. And I don't mean that they are teaching per se, but ask them to express what they've understood. And as they express what they've understood, it forces them to have to organize their thoughts, to have to figure out what it was that they, how they understood it. The expression of thought requires something that learning does not. It, silent, passive learning does not. Hey, you want to get started? Go home and talk. I give you permission. Talk to your spouse, your children, your parents about the sermon today. Be nice. That's all I ask. Be nice. Share the points that you thought you understood and that were things that you want to remember. It will help you to remember them. As you share with each other and make more of a habit of sharing your faith with each other, you will begin to gain a little more confidence to be able to share faith with those who maybe are, you're not as familiar with. But just take this principle with you today, that we need the expression of our faith in order to remember and grow in our faith. And uh, I'm coming to the close here because I know you're hungry. But I want to read a couple more statements to you. <clears throat> this particular statement I'm about to read has to do with our evangelistic effort of making disciples. You know, there's two ways to look at the Great Commission. One is to focus on the need to reach everyone. The other is to focus on the need for everyone to go and teach. One is to focus on reaching everyone. The other is to focus on mobilizing everyone. If our focus is on reaching everyone, we might try to do it with just pastors and evangelists, which is often what has been done. But if our focus is on mobilizing everyone, then we will reach everyone. <laughs> and this is a mindset, a shift in the way that we think about the Great Commission that needs to come down to the very heart of our churches. Ellen White writes, when we are successful in the work of soul saving, do we want to be successful? Absolutely. Those who are added to the faith, the new ones who are added to the faith, will in turn use their ability in giving the truth to others. So that's only if we're what? Successful. Which means it's possible that we can be having soul saving going on, but if those that, that we win to the faith are not giving expression to their faith, then what does that mean about our soul saving? It has been unsuccessful. Because the true measure of the church, and this is another quote, I don't have it in here, but the true measure of the church is the number of workers in the church, not the number of members in the church. And this is at the heart of a, of a culture in the church that we want to establish. A culture, really, of people who give expression to their faith, of teaching in the church. And so I'll give you one more quote. This is from our... Uh, Don read this for our thought for the day. Every soul is to obtain an education with the object in view of imparting his knowledge to others. We are to gather all the knowledge possible for the purpose of communicating the same that it may become the property of others. So when we obtain knowledge, when we're learning, what's the purpose of that learning? So that we can impart to others. I've been a pastor for a number of years, and I've encountered the, the 
uh, what do I want to say? The challenge that sometimes uh, we have with the idea of sharing our faith and trying to share the truth with others. I've encountered that amongst many church members. And I can tell you that sometimes our reasoning falls flat. For instance, I've often been told, Pastor, I don't understand it well enough. But the same person who says I don't understand it well enough doesn't come to the evangelistic meeting to learn it. The same person who says they don't understand it well enough is not studying to learn it well enough. They are actually stunted. They have told themselves, I can't do this. And they have made themselves unable to grow. Ellen White says that in order to grow in spirituality, that we must carry the burden of leading souls into the truth. And this is something that every one of us, it's just a a natural law for us. So here's my encouragement to you. As you uh, think about your own spiritual life, maybe you have not been giving expression to your faith, and now you're not sure you could tell someone why you keep the Sabbath. You understand what I'm saying? You know that it's right, but you don't really know that you could tell someone why from the Bible it's right. I've got an assignment assignment for you. Go find out why you keep the Sabbath. You know that when you die, you sleep. But you're not sure you could tell someone from the Bible why that is the case. I have an assignment for you. Go and study and learn until you understand it. Why? You can watch someone else present it. You can watch YouTube videos of Mark Finley or Doug Batchelor. You can study the Bible study guides. You can come to the evangelistic meeting that will happen this fall in this church. But this time, when you learn it, learn, as we've been instructed, with the object in view of doing what? Imparting it to others. And then, friends... We may not all immediately be the ones standing up at a pulpit sharing in this way, but start giving expression to the things that you understand to those around you. Give expression to your own family. Give expression to your own children. And then give expression in small group Bible study. Give expression in Sabbath school. Begin to give expression to what you believe. Begin to explain it. Begin to, as you do, you will, your ability to understand will grow. And you will actually expand your love for God and your conviction of the truth. This is my appeal to you. How many of you want to be not only learners, but you want to learn in order to teach? Will you make that decision with me today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. We know that none of us feel sufficient to be vessels of the truth. None of us does it perfectly. We all know that there are things that we might not fully understand. But Lord, help us to give expression to the things we do understand so that we will grow in our knowledge and in our love for you. I pray for every person who is here today, Lord, that you would impress our hearts that there may be somebody in our life right now, a loved one, a brother, a sister, a son or daughter or mother or father, an aunt or an uncle, a co-worker, a neighbor, someone that we can think of that we could begin to share expressions of our faith, things that we've learned, things that we've experienced with you, Lord. I pray that you would bless each one as we begin to embrace ourselves as disciple makers and not just disciples as learners. Help us, Father, to see that if we're going to multiply the church, that it's going to require every one of us to use the talents that you've given us. And that includes the talents of our own character and speech. So bless us, help us, forgive us when we fail because we know that we'll be imperfect. But help us to remember that your smile is always upon us 
when we are carrying out your mission and that those who carry out the Great Commission have the promise that you are with us always, even to the end of the age. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Join us as we sing our closing hymn. Please stand. Number 359, Hark, the Voice of Jesus Calling. I just want to remind you that on March 30, we will be offering training on how to offer someone Bible studies, how to give Bible studies. If you've never done it before, uh, did I say April 30? I don't know, but it is March 30. March 30 is when we will want to have some training. So plan to be there, and uh, I know the Lord will bless you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, now we ask that you would please bless and keep us that you would cause your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us, that you would lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace. In Jesus' name, amen.